Alors, bonjour tout le monde, euh, euh, nos participants de, de Orchestre de la francophonie, édition 2020. Euh, bonjour euh, et euh, bienvenue à cette session avec Dr. Chong qui euh, va nous présenter, présenter euh, euh, faire sa présentation sur euh, le sujet de la santé euh, pour les musiciens. La session aujourd'hui sera euh, en anglais, euh, mais Alexandra euh, de l'OF, euh, euh, si nécessaire, va traduire euh, les questions. Il y, a, il y aura beaucoup d'opportunités pour des questions à chaque 20 minutes euh, dans le programme. Alors, euh, préparez vos, vos questions. Uh, good morning, everybody. We're just about to start our uh, session with uh, Dr. Chong from the uh, Musicians Clinics of Canada Performing Arts Medicine Association. We're very pleased um, to be able to present uh, Dr. Chong and um, uh, to Orchestre de la Francophonie uh, today. And so without further ado, um, um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Dr. Chong to Orchestre de la Francophonie. Good morning, Dr. Chong. Good morning. Good morning to all. Good afternoon, wherever you are, or good evening. Hopefully it's not in the middle of the night. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today uh, on the topic of tuning the mind and body of the musician for optimal health and performance. So who am I? Well, I am a physician. I've been running the Musicians Clinics of Canada for over 30 years. I have a background in piano and composition at the Glenn Gould School, uh, Royal Conservatory in the old days. And uh, I also went through electrical engineering and did electrical, uh, electronic music actually in Ottawa at the National Research Council where Maurizio is. I'm speaking to you from Hamilton, Ontario, which is just west of Toronto. And I went to medical school there and did a lot of my medical training through McMaster University, which is where we're based. <clears throat> um, there's also some interesting uh, research going on at the University of Toronto. So Canada is quite a hotbed of uh, the interface of music and medicine. So hopefully you'll enjoy uh, some of the uh, uh, information that I'll go through. I've divided it up into four movements. It's going to feel like a uh, sight reading a Bruckner symphony. So every 20, 25 minutes, uh, we'll get, do a little stretch break. You guys do all your uh, exercises, do some breathing, meditation. I will deke out to the boys' room uh, as usual. So um, without further ado, we'll carry on. So the history of um, performing arts medicine uh, goes back into the uh, early 1980s. And uh, it's an organization that was brought together by Dr. Alice Brand from Brenner, uh, who has uh, very talented kids. Um, so if you know that name, uh, her, one of her uh, sons is uh, at Santa Fe Opera and as a cellist. And she decided to keep an eye on her kids and become the uh, summer camp doctor at Aspen Music Festival. So she got the uh, great idea to, to get uh, interested initially physicians and other healthcare professionals later uh, as now researchers and, and now educators involved in this uh, eclectic organization, which is now worldwide. And it has its own journal, Medical Problems of Performing Artists. And there's our website, artsmed.org. So, uh, a number of uh, interesting characters approached her, obviously at Aspen Music uh, Festival, some very famous people, including uh, uh, very injured uh, musicians such as Leon Fleischer, which I'll get into, and others, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, and, uh, and she dealt with issues um, such as headaches or the flu. She for sure did not have to deal with COVID, which we're all facing now, but uh, she got a first-hand look of uh, what was going on and the kind of injuries uh, that would arise during an intensive summer program like you're involved in now, but obviously not virtually. 
So the picture you're seeing is the start of research into this area, what actually goes on in the mind of the uh, musician that is a brain scanner. It's an old, old picture. And you can see these dots uh, in the brain, which is uh, representing oxygen consumption or electrical activity in the uh, pianist. I think he's trying to play the third movement of the Italian concerto, uh, one of Glenn Gould's least favorite pieces. But So the concepts I'll start out with is the awareness of performance stress and we'll get into the data about injury and illness, first of all. And then I'll get later on into the types of injuries and then into some of the, the mechanisms of the injuries. And then we'll end up in the fourth movement with a big bang of what we actually can do about it in terms of treatment and prevention. So this uh, funny cartoon uh, shows the kind of uh, concepts, I'm a pianist, and obsessed with Steinways um, and to some degree Yamaha's, but we, uh, in my uh, training, I didn't really think about the, the mind and body and, and injury. So I actually got injured myself when I was 14. I played Massey Hall and got all the awards and all that stuff, but I was obsessively practicing the Wander Fantasy, which is by Schubert. So any of you who've tried to play that, it's, it's a real uh, high risk, very long and, and very difficult uh, uh, piece of repertoire. So you know you're spending a lot of time in your studio now, especially extra time doing virtually, but traditionally we spend about six hours in the studio and once in a while we'll come out of our little, uh, I call it uh, piano mold cave uh, and appear on the stage and get all anxious and then hopefully nothing bad happens when people like us and clap and approve. So, and we also have our heroes in our mind, whether it be Rostropovich or in my case Rubinstein or Horowitz, and we practice you know, to a point of uh, no return to achieve these goals in our mind. So that's what the game is about and, and you have excellent faculty to coach you you have uh, ensembles and, and of course, reference um, recordings to compare yourself to, uh, which is a whole other area of, of intrigue. First point is <clears throat> we're not doing it for the money. This is Canadian data um, that was presented at the regional meeting, PAMA regional meeting in 2015. And the data is probably a lot worse during the COVID pandemic, but you can see the musicians and singers at that time made about 16,000 Canadian dollars. So you can translate into American or pounds or euros, whatever currency. And uh, that's not uh, very good. Now we're doing it for other reasons, which we'll get into the, the joy of music and the thrill of performance. But uh, this is one of the major risk factors in, in this kind of endeavor. The history of the Musicians Clinics of Canada goes back uh, to 1986. And when I was on faculty at McMaster uh, full time, I'm still on clinically. Um, the organization of Canadian symphony musicians, which happens to be our, our Canadian union, got together and did a, a brief survey of members and came up with an injury uh, rate prevalence of around 60-70% and said, we need a clinic. So uh, at that time, the Canada Health Act was brought into play, which uh, gives um, Canadians uh, except those in Quebec, so our universality, accessibility, and portability across the country. Um, so we uh, started the clinic uh, by a group of Hamilton Philharmonic musicians, and it was uh, a stressful situation, so I always credit Boris Brott, uh, Maurizio's good friend and my good friend, for creating the conditions in which we needed a musician's clinic, and we still are carrying on even during the COVID uh, pandemic. The kind of uh, medical problems that we see is, is coded in, if any of you are good at crossword puzzle, you will see the acronym MADNESS, M-A-D-N-E-S-S -S there. 
muscle fatigue, anxiety, depression, nerve entrapment, stress syndrome. And no surprise, we have cuts to funding. And I'm sure those who organize your great summer project are spending most of their time trying to raise funds. I work with the National Youth Orchestra since 1988, and it's uh, always uh, a challenge. All the orchestras across Canada and all the arts organizations are really having an extremely difficult time, even prior to COVID. So we'll get back to the origins of the definition of injuries. It comes uh, from common symptoms. This is the work of Christine Zaza when she was doing her uh, master's thesis uh, in the late 80s here at McMaster. So she, she uh, described common musculoskeletal symptoms, pain during and after playing, numbness and tingling, weakness and loss of control as the primary uh, presenting playing related um, musculoskeletal symptoms. I like this definition, which was uh, going back into the 1970s of repetitive strain injury. These, by the way, the interesting font is the original slides I created in 1986. Uh, so it really hasn't changed much. So it's pain and loss of function in muscles, joint ligaments, joints, muscle tendon junctions, peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system and this is the key phrase, due to use, which is excessive for the individual affected, okay? Use which is excessive for the individual affected. So it's a, it's a within subject def, definition, which is why it's difficult to measure across a, a group uh, of orchestral players uh, like yourselves, because comparing apples and oranges and different instruments and et cetera is, is quite difficult. Here's a good uh, study, probably the best we, benchmark we have put together by uh, Bronwyn Ackerman, my colleague and a journal editor of MPPA uh, from Sydney, Australia. So this was funded by the Australian government. Um, uh, for all you Canadian politicians listening in, we're still yet to, to uh, have a successful grant to do a Canadian study, but this is, um, pretty amazing data. So the punchline that the press gets is 84% lifetime prevalence of injury, which is astounding. It's, it's worse than uh, professional football. Um, and at any given time, there's a 50-50 chance of playing hurt. Okay, so that's just astronomical rates that are they're up into high contact sports. And the risk factors were identified in this study of 400 professional orchestral musicians in, in Australia. So it's very well done. So excessive muscle tension, we'll talk about it, long practice sessions, insufficient rest, poor posture, muscle fatigue, sudden increase in playing, repertoire scheduling, stress, lack of fitness, and insufficient warm up. So you can, uh, uh, access that study and the references are at the bottom of the screen. Here's another study from the Sydney group, <clears throat> which is a, about popular musicians. So you can see along the bottom there, the different genres of popular music. And on the uh, left side of the screen, the average age of death. Okay, so those are the, the dark blue and the dark gold are the male and female phys, uh, musicians compared to the uh, US life expectancy male and female in the thinner lines. So as you see, uh, starting with the blues and jazz on the left in New Orleans and moving into uh, Nashville across the way in world music, it's not that bad. But when you get into rock and punk and metal hip hop, it's quite astounding you're seeing um, musicians uh, die into their uh, late 20s and early 30s. So quite astounding uh, data. This is uh, done by Diana Kenny, K-E-N-N-Y. The causes of death are as follows. So you can see on the left side, the different genres of, of music and uh, 
the causes of death. And the red are the one are the rates excessive compared to the average, and green is uh, below the average rate. So you can see in the blues and and the jazz folks, it's a lot of chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, and, and of course the folk musicians, high rates of cancer. So you think about what could be the causes, and I'm sure you're thinking, hmm, uh, getting old, poor lifestyle, maybe too much smoking tobacco, too much drinking, etc. Now, if you go down to the bottom of the list, the rap and hip hop uh, group, uh, you'll see red uh, data percentages in the accidental suicide and homicide columns. So any of you who enjoy rap and going to the clubs, or I guess you can't go to the clubs now, but before COVID, uh, it's, you can sort of think about, hmm, how many people were shot? Uh, how many uh, uh, violent deaths there were? How many overdoses were there? Okay, so. That's quite interesting. Now, this is an amazing study of 13,000 dead rock stars between uh, 1951 and 2014. So it's a big sample. So Amy Winehouse is in there, Jimi Hendrix is in there, all your favorite. Of course, Prince is in there, etc. Here's some more up to date data. This is uh, the uh, United Kingdom, UK. Musicians Union uh, did a snapshot using SurveyMonkey of what was going on about mental health. And you can see that uh, anxiety and depression is a big deal. So musicians may be up to three times more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression compared to the uh, general UK uh, public. And some of the reasons, the qual qualitative data of why they're so stressed uh, poor working condition, conditions, difficulty sustaining a living, antisocial working hours, exhaustion, inability to plan their time and future. Obviously, even worse now with COVID. Lack of recognition for one's work and the welding of music and identity into one's idea of selfhood. So that's a key point. We're how we're so self-identified in our egos about being a musician, the perfect musician. Physical uh, impacts of the music uh, career, uh, such as overuse, and issues related to the problems of being a woman in the industry, uh, from balancing work and family commitments to sexist attitudes and even sexual harassments. So you're probably very well aware of uh, the rise of Me Too uh, complaints in the uh, uh, arts and entertainment industry uh, right across the world. And um, some of our dearest colleagues have uh, been very brave to bring this issue into the uh, public domain. And, um, and, and organizations and universities and conservatories uh, are now uh, uh, having policies to, to um, increase awareness and, and um, uh, deal with uh, such issues. Performing arts medicine is very active in this Me Too issue. And uh, uh, we are the uh, lead go-to organization for uh, not only uh, researching this, but also uh, uh, reducing some of the impact of, of the abuse. Now, I'm gonna end the <clears throat> data section with a big study because this is a complete uh, snapshot of the arts and entertainment industry. So. One of the problems of being a classical musician, you know, how do I actually make a living at this unless I become a university professor? So this, this study groups it into the performers and the, your composers, such as myself, the support workers in group two, and the tech, techies uh, in group three. So it, it really includes the, the whole uh, uh, group of workers. So the punchline uh, that the press gets is that there's, uh, we love our work. And there's, that's why you're all tuned in today. Uh, but there, the actual industry itself has a very powerful negative culture within it. Described as a toxic, bruising work environment, extreme competition, bullying, sexual assault, sexism, and uh, racism. 
these are high levels, uh, there are high levels of mental health uh, problems and suicidality. The small print is uh, much of what we've already covered. First uh, item of exploration are work and sleep patterns. So uh, you're not working nine to five for sure. So you all know we all have many other responsibilities, normal day, day life, day jobs, family life. And then we also have to practice, and then we often perform in the evening, and then have to after hours fun and frolic, and late night pizza and drinks, etc. So uh, sleep is a big problem. So once we get into the science of what these injuries and illnesses are about, you're starting to to create a picture. Hmm. Where there's not a lot of recovery time, and the lifestyle itself is quite chaotic. The actual mental health data, um, the most common uh, types of problems with depression and anxiety across the three groups. The uh, prevalence reports of 44% uh, had moderate to severe anxiety, which is uh, rated at 10 times higher than the general population, in this case, Australian general population. Levels of depression are five times higher than the general population and about 60% uh, wanted to seek professional advice for mental health issues. Breaking that down, the most serious are suicide attempts, suicidal ide ideation, thinking about it, which is about nine times higher than the general population. In the last 12 months, uh, ideation is five to seven times higher and two to three times uh, higher over a lifetime and planning uh, uh, your uh, death is uh, four to five times more than the general population. So I've worked quite intimately with the National Youth Orchestra. As you may know, we did have a, a tragedy um, uh, which is brought on a special uh, program in the NYOC. Uh, other um, groups I've worked with, uh, such as the Royal Conservatory, Glenn Gould School is very active. Uh, in um, uh, fast recognition and, and referral of mental health issues. I was just on a Zoom call with a colleague at Colburn down in LA and they've already had one suicide this year. So it's a pretty important issue to, to raise and highlight. Okay, mischief we get into is a big topic. Um, uh, alcohol, um, we have our uh, uh, daily drink or two or three after our gig is tradition. Tradition. I know all the NACO, the National Arts Center folks, go to a special pub downtown. And um, but the actual uh, data shows 11 to 19 standard drinks in one day, which is double the rate of Australia. So of course Australians drink at least as much as us Canadians. But that's quite an astounding number. So uh, figure that one out. Meth and amphetamine uh, is eight times greater. Just to stay awake, I guess. Ecstasy to, to feel in the groove is seven times greater. Cocaine, 12 times greater. Uh, marijuana relatively is not such a big deal. And we in Canada, you know, are totally um, uh, recreational medical cannabis uh, is is right across the board. So it's not really an issue that much here. Uh, Painkillers such as opioids um, is seven times greater and that's the, the big one. As you know, Prince and, and uh, Michael Jackson are great tragedies, great loss of uh, artists and tranquilizers just to calm down nine times greater. Um, astounding. Uh, and about 20% of, of that uh, 400 uh, or so <clears throat> musician or, or workers, actually, sorry, that's about 3,000 workers uh, declared they were addicted compared to 4.5 of the general population. So um, it's a big, 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 big issue. Certainly in the clinic here, that's why we were geared up not only for injury assessment and uh, treatment, but also for mental health and addiction issues. Okay, I'll take a break there. Uh, first movement is done.
and you guys can go on your chat boxes and and uh, type in questions that Alexandra can accumulate. And uh, I'll take a slight little breather here. OK, uh, on va prendre une petite pause uh, et ça vous donne le temps de, de poser vos questions uh, dans, la, dans la fenêtre uh, uh, questions et réponses. So we're going to take uh, a little uh, breather, glass of water, uh, bio break, and uh, that will give you time to put your questions in the Q&A box. Alors, on va prendre une petite pause de, de quatre minutes. Ça vous donne le temps de, de uh, poser vos questions. Okay. Any questions come in? I have a question to start us off. Um, and I don't know if this is too general and too broad uh, of a question, Dr. Chong, but I was really interested uh, in um, the comparison between professional musicians and professional athletes and the disparity between the injury rates. Could you talk a little bit about that? What, what makes that disparity so great? Is it because in the culture of um, uh, professional athletes, injury prevention, physical training is just so much more part of the program than it has right. been for professional musicians? Right. So we're about 20, 30 years be behind uh, where sports medicine is. So if you go to the, um, just Google in athletes, and the arts, all one, uh, .org. We also have a side project with the American College of Sports Medicine, which is exactly asking that question. How come <clears throat> in dance and music and acting, etc., are the rates so astronomically high? And I think that bears out uh, the, where we're, uh, you know, we're just waking up to some of these risk factors right now. So, um, so we're at the implementation phase. Pama is working with um, all the uh, different music colleges across the U.S., which is called NASM, National Association Schools of Music across Canada, with all the universities, and of course, the Glenn Gould School, and right around the world. But again, imp implementing these uh, issues, increasing awareness, uh, how much time, how many notes you're pumping out, uh, what exercises you should do, what's, what's your diet, what about your sleep, this is what we're going to talk about today. So, um, excellent question. So, yeah. Thank you. And while we uh, accumulate some more questions, uh, perhaps we'll move on to movement sure. two. Movement right, two. You. We're going to talk about ergonomics and injuries. So, you can see I spent many two hours getting a nice shape of all the ergonomic risk factors. So what is the term ergonomics? It's, it's basically the biomechanics, the relationship of the human body to the task. So uh, in occupational medicine, we've studied lifting boxes or how to drive a bus. Um, in, in dance, there's uh, quite a bit of advanced work on the biomechanics of going up on point. Uh, but in music, uh, much of my work has been about the interface between musical instruments and how we play. And here it's a very good example of a clarinet and the weight of the clarinet resting on the thumb uh, for whatever, six hours a day. And the thumb obviously is not designed to do that. Um, so uh, that's just one example. We can go through into string instruments and and problems with the neck. We can go into playing uh, other wind instruments and embouchure uh, difficulties, playing cello and bass, double bass in the back, uh, strain, et cetera, et cetera. So you gotta look at all the different factors, posture, tension, force, support, duration, repetition, 
recovery, strength, fitness, size, all these kind of issues. So it's uh, <clears throat> ideal for my background in bioengineering um, and, and looking at all the stresses and strains of playing. How come I'm frozen here? There we go. Uh, I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, applied anatomy here. Uh, many of the injuries are in the forearm. So if you actually peel away the skin, you'll see the red stuff. Those are called muscles. And I'll try to find my cursor here. And this yellow thing here is called a nerve. And these gray things are called ligaments. Um, and this is the top of your forearm. And this is a common site of injury, pain in the upper forearm right there. Um, so whether you're playing a lot of piano or bowling uh, or uh, operating keys, there's a lot of uh, strain on these muscles as well as potential for squishing the yellow structures, which are called nerves. We call that nerve entrapments. Uh, so the, the radial nerve here is entrapped by the supinator muscle, why it's called supinator syndrome. So there are many you know, hundreds of different types of uh, muscle and nerve injuries in the upper extremities and shoulder and neck. Um, so this is one good example of the, the type of injury. And you can see the, the pain distribution and the complexity. Here's another one uh, that is well known called carpal tunnel syndrome, which is compression of the median nerve at the wrist by the flexor retinaculum. Here you can see this. And you get this uh, numbness distribution in thumb and half the uh, ring finger. So this is much more common in computer users and, and uh, in the workplace using uh, impact tools. Um, you will see much less of it uh, from a prevalence point of view amongst musicians. You'll see a lot more of what I'm gonna show you next, which is called thoracic outlet syndrome or entrapment of the uh, brachial plexus. So this is, hopefully you can see that, is a big complex of nerves that comes out of the neck and uh, like crisscross junction somewhere in Highway 20 and Metropolitan in Montreal. It's kind of crazy in there and then branches out into the different nerve bundles uh, down the forearm and into the hand. Also there are arteries that supply blood and the blue structures are veins that return the blood from the upper extremity. So when you have muscle tension or postural difficulties or squeezing the left side with your uh, violin, you may uh, easily develop a, a dynamic compression of these structures called thoracic outlet syndrome. So it's a clinical diagnosis, uh, not well recognized by sports medicine or your general uh, physicians out there, but it's extremely common in the musician uh, population. Now the one that caught the fascination of uh, neurologists and of course Dr. Branfen Brenner and Dr. Letterman in the uh, origin, original days of uh, performing arts medicine, was a condition called focal dystonia, um, which is a fancy term for motor control problems. So when I injured myself when I was 14, I did have some trouble with uh, cramping of my hand as well as pain and some nodules on the tendon. So it's, it, it's not one or the other, it sort of comes together. So in the top brain scan, you can see, uh, where is my cursor here? This is, uh, uh, normal scan on the top, you can see all the brain activity. And this is again operating the right hand. So the left side of the brain operates the right hand. But in the dystonic patient, where there's a cramping or loss of control, there's a smudging of the motor control circuits, or I call it fried noodles or chow mein syndrome. Okay. And so uh, Dr. Eckhart Altenmuller in Hanover has done some of the amazing research. The, the, the sentinel case is Leon Fleischer, who still comes to Toronto and uh, not recently, but 
that still teaches at the Glenn Gould School. And he's got the cramp. Uh, Vladimir Horowitz had that cramp. Peter Ungen had the cramp on his left hand. You can also get focal dystonia in your voice. Uh, and uh, Whitney Houston had that at the end of her career before her tragic death. So it's, a, it's more common than you think. Probably 10% of my patients in the musician's clinic have been affected, with, affected by these motor control uh, issues. Very uh, difficult to, to treat, um, and we can get into some of that later. Uh, for you who sing, those of you who sing, uh, you may get into vocal overuse. So on the left uh, picture, you can see some inflammatory uh, lesions on the cords. But again, uh, because of the lifestyle issues, uh, especially in the bar, uh, belters and blues singers, you gotta make sure there's nothing growing on the cords. So any, any vocalist knows to, to make sure they get scoped. Uh, Hearing loss is a big, big issue. I've collaborated with Marshall Chasen as the audiologist in the clinic since the early 80s. And uh, this is what it looks like inside the, the cochlea, which is the sensory organ in, in the inner ear. So it's basically like a, uh, the sound waves go in and, and bomb out those little delicate hair cells. These are the outer hair cells here and you see they get smashed uh, and knocked over, and once they're damaged by the acoustic stimulation, uh, they don't grow back, and you get problems with um, uh, uh, recognition of uh, sound. You can also get pitch uh, and speech perception difficulties, and of course, the dreaded ringing in the ears. If you want to look up some of the famous cases, Janet Horvath, colleague. Um, previous uh, cellist in the Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Orchestra. Uh, she had to uh, stop her career. Carolyn Christie has been quite vocal, uh, who you may know, uh, flautist in the uh, OSM. Again, problems with uh, overexposure uh, to sound in the orchestra. Big problem, it's a silent problem. And once you uh, have the symptoms, it's often too late. So why hearing protection is important. Dosimetry is important, which I'll get into next. So you gotta know what you're exposed to. Um, here's the exposure rules. Uh, the threshold legally is for, uh, 40 hours at 85 dB <clears throat> with a three, B, three decibel doubling rule. So if you have the amount of time, the allowable limit is 88 decibels, 2.5 hours going down the list, 97 dB. But our dosimetry uh, measures in symphony orchestras are uh, often at 100 and 510 decibels. Uh, so my dosimetry going way back, doing Debussy La Mer when we were in Kingston, of course I fell asleep, but uh, my job was to guard the dos dosimeters across the stage and they were, they were all over 100. Uh, doing you know something that didn't seem very loud. So if you're doing Mahler and some of the big stuff or with Tycho drummers, you're gonna get really uh, heavily exposed. Um, so um, there was a study out of Australia and looking at your cumulative weekly dose and most of the orchestra musicians were over the limit uh, by Tuesday, you know, starting basically two days into the weekly cycle. So you gotta be careful um, that, you, that again, you, you protect yourself or limit the amount of exposure. Uh, there are apps, very cheap apps uh, for free or better ones for maybe a dollar or two on your uh, phone, which will give you a good dosimetry uh, estimate of, of what you're doing. So uh, probably, uh, never play without knowing what your exposure limit is. Now I'm gonna ease into this, um, some of the neurology. Uh, this is structure is called the arcuate fasciculus. Don't remember this or the auditory motor tract. So our game is connecting what we hear or God forbid what the composer is writing there and what we hear the sound and uh, wiring it to our motor system. So that's basically the game. Uh, you guys are all very advanced, obviously, and um, uh, 
this is the structure that gets wired. Okay, so all you're gonna hear me use this term wiring. So this is in a nod, the uh, person on the right, the brain here, where is my cursor here? This is the arcuate fasciculus of a non-musician. This is the left and right AF. In a musician, you can see it's bigger, it's wider, it's got more bandwidth, it's more complex. So there are structural differences measured um, using the functional magnetic resonance imaging technique. Um, so that's a key point. Your brain is different than your twin who is a non-musician. Now, why do we do this? I made the comment, it's not because of money, we're getting pleasure. So the pleasure hormone in our mind and body is called dopamine, which is of course the root of all evil and all those addiction substances I talked about. So music in itself is a mild, very mild addictive uh, uh, process uh, activity that generates dopamine. So this is a study done by Rob Zatori at Montreal Neurological, looking at the effect of music on dopamine production in the brain. So the, the subject picks whatever kind of music from Lady Gaga to Piazzolla, whatever you like, and uh, they combine uh, functional MRI with positron emission tomography, amazing technique, and then can localize the uptake uh, and activity of any substance they tag, in this case, dopamine. And this is an area called the uh, ventral striatum and the nucleus accumbens. These are the reward centers. Um, so as time goes on, you can see there's an anticipation, anticip uh, anticipation of pleasure and then uh, in the dark line, a big burst of the peak experience or Jimi Hendrix, you know, the experience, or you can pick Brahms or whatever you like, that's the buzz we want to get. So basically we're like uh, little rats on a gerbil wheel in a little cage, you know, trying to get our uh, music reward as we practice. And of course, putting it all together in ensemble is where it's at and uh, why these great works of repertoire stand alone. And you probably got your top three on your list that are the big dopamine generators. Now, word of caution here, you start messing around with cocaine or messing around with other dopamine generators, uh, such as opioids or uh, meth, etc. it's gonna way override the Brahms effect or Beethoven effect. So you're seeing why the popular musicians get into a lot of trouble. Of course, they work so hard to be Elton John and work so hard to be Prince, but then the industry essentially pays them in alcohol and cocaine and opioids, and you end up in a very uh, bad way, uh, not getting your musical high, which they uh, have been renowned for and are waiting for their next hit of heroin. Uh, as you probably can just go on Netflix or go on uh, Amazon Prime and see you know, many of the tragic documentaries on uh, the life and death of many of our famous musicians. It's a big problem in classical music too, so uh, don't uh, underestimate that. But dopamine is, is where it's at. Another concept is, is neuroplasticity. So uh, when I went to medical school, school ages ago, 40 plus years ago, we didn't understand what neuroplasticity meant. Now we do. And uh, the key concept uh, is what fires together gets wired together. So just remember that. So this is why we practice. And, but it doesn't, the brain doesn't know whether it's right or wrong or good or bad or whether it generates dopamine. Whatever you do just keeps getting wired in there. Now the other concept is the real estate. So you're seeing a big area of the sensory part of the brain devoted to the face, the head and neck, and a huge area to the upper extremity here from the thumb, uh, upper arm, etc. Not so much in the lower extremity, but if you think of singers, you think of instrumentalists, you're looking at a huge, you know, at least 80, 90% of, of the surface area and the wiring of the brain. So it's very important that what we do, what fires together, 
you realize gets wired together and you have to be meticulous in your wiring uh, of what you do, which means your practice, uh, etc. Of course, we know the old law, use it or lose it. So that doesn't apply to you guys because you practice like, like mad. But I have many patients who have day jobs who have, haven't uh, pursued or pursued their musical interest later in life. And it gets pretty, pretty uh, complicated. So if we actually put it all together, uh, that's what you actually look like. It's a bit distorted and kind of funny, but us musicians have big mitts and singers have big tongues and big lips and the wind players, same, big hands and big faces. Uh, now, if you look at any sports, hockey's coming back, yay. And uh, you're seeing the golf tour coming and baseball, who knows when it's gonna happen. Uh, or your soccer players, of course, the the sensory, somatosensory homunculus is gonna be very different depending on how you've wired yourself or shaped your, your nervous system. So that's why I like that concept, tuning your mind and body for optimal performance. So this key concept of what are what am I working on? What am I wiring? It's a little different than just doing your hand and exercises every morning or just doing your morning yoga to wake up, etc. It's it's it takes a little bit of awareness uh, to figure out, you know, what am I doing in, as I practice? So that's the question I, I want uh, to leave you with and think about. Now, this again was defined by Wilder Penfield, Montreal, great Montreal neurosurgeon in 1930s at Montreal Neurological, where he actually stimulated the brain, the surface of the brain. He opened it up and and uh, stimulated it and people smelt burning toast or twitched their arm. Or, uh, so he was able to localize the surface area and anatomy of the brain, remarkable for its time. Now we have all these fancy brain scanners and um, it's amazing what the technology now and moving forward, you know, very exciting uh, area of, uh, of exploration. Okay, I'll take another uh, break. So that's the end of movement two. Um, you can think of some questions and type them into Alex, Alexandra. Okay. On va prendre une, une autre petite pause et uh, s'il vous plaît, um, posez vos questions dans la, la fenêtre questions et, et uh, réponses. On revient dans quatre minutes. Merci. Just a hint, you might want to get up and stretch. <laughs> certainly take your eyes off the screen because uh, all this intensive uh, Zoom work is extremely fatiguing on the eyes and the brain, very intense. So I'll do a little quick meditation break. I'll be right back. And um, first question is from Matthews Vec. Are higher rates of drug use, mental health issues, and alcoholism across the entertainment industry relatively evenly spread across different genres slash disciplines? Or could the averages be weighted by specific subgroups, i.e. COD for musicians by homicide suicide is more common in hip hop, rap, and punk musicians, but an average across all musicians could obscure this. Right. So that's an excellent question about population data. So this is what day-to-day um, -day as a clinician treating one-on-one -on -one with patients versus what the descriptive population data show. So any population data only can point to uh, trends and hypotheses, you know, questions you're thinking about. Much like in COVID, you know, there's risks of this virus, but the real question from day to day we all stress about is, am I at risk? Should I wear a mask? What if that, you know, person next to me who br gets closer than two meters, etc. So this is the dia dialectic 
that we all have to face between individual situations and, and risks versus what the population health data points us to. So you're absolutely correct, you know, and, and again, you know, those who are familiar with the hip hop scene and the violence uh, that's going on is, uh, is huge. But again, uh, we don't have that kind of uh, uh, data uh, for the classical musicians, but I can allude to my clinical work. You know, there's lots of classical musicians who are in trouble with, with um, alcohol for sure and a lot of opioids uh, because of the pain issues um, are a big, big problem that I deal with day-to-day uh, -to -day here. So good question. Okay, thank you, Matthew. And a question from Luca. Uh, about focal dystonia, I have heard that it is, as you said, uh, a career ender. What can we do as prevention exercises? What is the difference between the type that Fleischer had and that Alex Klein had, which he was able to overcome? Right. Uh, question mark. Yeah, excellent question as well. So <clears throat> if you're aware of it, and my intention is not to uh, create an anxiety of, of getting the cramps or your embouchure um, getting lost, but to become more aware of the wiring process as we practice. So what the next session is, uh, I'm gonna get into all the stress and it'll become quite obvious uh, to how the evolution of these circuitry problems, uh, uh, whether it be motor control or pain or anxiety depression evolves because of the stress response. So if, if you're interested in on Leon Fleischer, he has a, a 17 minute uh, documentary on Vimeo um, called uh, uh, Two Hands, um, which is really, really well done. So you can see the personality and, and Leon goes into his childhood stuff. He goes into the stresses of trying to uh, play the best Schumann concerto uh, in the peak of his career in, in, the, in his 30s. And then the injury happening and the rest of his life trying to fight it. Uh, rewiring and getting Botox and injections, etc. So it's, it really just hits, hits the nail on the head when it comes to focal dystonia. So when you see all these incredible uh, musicians and athletes doing all these pyrotechnics, it's, you still, you know, I still worship all, all these uh, great players, but in, in the latest Chopin winner, etc. But you begin to wonder at what cost. And so uh, the higher you go and the more perfectionistic, the more obsessive, the more stressed uh, you are, there's, we've done some research uh, coming out about uh, uh, the risk factors and especially early childhood trauma that will be published uh, within the next year. Uh, so that's a very important question. You know, how does this evolve? It just doesn't happen. So we'll get into this in the third movement in detail. Excellent. Okay, maybe maybe one more uh, question. This might be a segue to your next movement, Dr. Chong. And and if it is, um, you may want to answer this now or maybe afterwards. Yeah. Uh, what can we do to alleviate pain caused by repetitive stress injuries if resting is not possible due to an overloaded work schedule? Yeah, excellent. So I'm gonna, uh, actually movement three and four will uh, address that. So of course pain is the most common presenting uh, symptom. So once we go through the mechanisms of how this evolves and then in the fourth movement we'll actually look at treatment and prevention strategies in quite a bit of detail. So good. So I'll, I might as well just carry on. So the third movement is about the stress response. So this is a very uh, recent area of scientific uh, uh, endeavor and just uh, starting to be uh, involved in in awareness in general medical care. So Debor Mate, who's a physician out of Vancouver, who's worked a lot with the East Vancouver ad addicts, published a book and uh, and presented at PEMA in 2011. Uh, what uh, is a great reference, a great read called "When the Body Says No," and explores the stress disease connection. So as I've just said, it's not a random act of fate. 
much related to our social and emotional lives. So mainstream medical practice, and I'm a traditional, sort of traditional McMaster trained doctor, uh, but the mi mind and body are, are not separate. That's the first key concept. And individual humans cannot be separated from their psychological and social relationships. So very important as you move through your training and your life and starting your families, et cetera. You know, a lot of thinking and planning needs to go into that. So whether we want to maintain health or regain health after an injury or an illness, these concepts are central to our understanding. What is at the core of all this? Well, the authentic self-expression is the key. You don't have to be a musician to worry about that. And if you're a politician, certain individuals are worried about their self-expression. If you're in the ghetto um, in the States currently, it's authentic self-expression. Everybody's now stressed because of COVID because they can't get out there and perform. Um, it's uh, obvious. So it's not just limited to artistic self-expression, playing Chopin the way I want to play it, but it's finding our authentic self and, and being true to that self. So what lies behind the mind-body connection? Well, it's hardwired in uh, uh, the hormonal system uh, and the neurological system. So this is a, a diagram connecting the brain and the core parts of the brain through the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys and produce stress hormone, which is known as cortisol. And depending what the brain perceives or remembers or what anticipates can produce and vary the amount of stress hormone produced at any given time. So this is called psychophysiology of adverse childhood educational occupational events, your experience. And if life doesn't deal you with the perfect hand, you might develop a chronic stress response. So this has been well researched by Bessel van der Kolk and of course Gabor Mate and uh, Robert Sapolsky are the key authors and they're well uh, written up in the literature. Now another great researcher Stephen Porges has um, looked at the mind-body connection and, and it's uh, it's called uh, the vagus nerve or my joke is what happens to the vagus stays in the vagus. So it's very important to be aware of what's going on. This is called mindfulness. So if everything's all things bright and beautiful, everything's perfect in your life, everything's gonna function great. And your social engagement system is perfect. Obviously none of us are socially engaged perfectly in, in cooped up uh, watching uh, Netflix and doing these Zoom webinars. So if you have a sympathetic response or a fight or flight response, you will mobilize your uh, system, heart rate will increase, stress hormone will increase. And so there's an activation or mobilization response. If this is going on and on and on and on and chronic, so if this pandemic never ends and we're never able to resume normal music and normal training, we get tired, the system gets immobilized, gets shut down. So the primitive uh, parts of the vagus uh, take over. And in fact, everything uh, goes the opposite. Heart rate goes down, cortisol depletes. You may feel, have symptoms of depression, chronic pain, um, and even PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So that, what fires together gets wired together. What happens to the vagus stays in the vagus. Complicated slide here, um, but I'll run through it in stepwise. So if somebody, the last question was, when our workload is too much, when we don't have time to take a break, excellent. Okay, that's called allostatic overload, where your current physiological limit is exceeded. Okay, so the normal response is to up your game. So you will arouse your mind-body system to try to meet that demand and it's a rapid response so in a normal fearful situation 
somebody coughs at you, you freak out. There's a rapid response and it's a feed forward system, okay? So, but it, unfortunately the stress system lacks boundaries. So when it goes up, there's no off switch. So this is what's happening in the COVID pandemic. The more data you see, you watch CNN, you get a whole bunch of feeds coming in. The rates are sky high. Well, public health doesn't know what to do. We don't have a vaccine. And then we just completely start obsessing about it. Uh, in our world, in music, uh, one wrong note, you die. <laughs> so, you know, when we practice, we have lots of wrong notes. And uh, if you, uh, treat that as, a, as an allostatic overload, or if the conductor's on your case, it's going back to when the clinic started, and then we're gonna have this situation where the stress system gets stuck on and there is no off switch. So I, I rem, try to remember this. Normally, what goes up must come down. Spinning wheel got to go around, blood, sweat, and tears. But in allostatic overload, there is a, an up, up, and away fifth dimension response where the system keeps generating more cortisol and then we get the toxic effects of stress hormone throughout the body. And <clears throat> no system, no cell in your body is spared the effect of the chronic stress. So what happens is there's an overdrive of the sympathetic fight or flight system. There's an underdrive of the repair system or parasympathetic system because the constant loop, one wrong note, one wrong note, I'm no good. And these circuits go round and round. Developing a uh, inflammatory response in the immune system and developing cytokines. So cytokines are um, cells that kill, okay? So you've heard about in the COVID, you get a cytokine storm, you know, which makes you get up, get into the uh, intensive care unit and an, on a respirator. And that is a hugely aberrant response of the immune system. So this happens again in our musician population where the stress in the orchestra uh, or the interplay between the conductor and the musicians is not healthy. And we develop uh, these uh, uh, syndromes. So it's uh, just trying to find my cursor again here. It gets lost. There it is. So one year of chronic stress equals six years of biological aging. This is not just my opinion. This is Nobel Prize winning science that Elizabeth Blackburn and Alyssa Eppel uh, been publishing in the early 2000s and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Science and Medicine in 2009 for this amazing uh, work. And so coming back to the clinic, uh, day to day we see lots of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, MS, and dementia. So just going through that little list in the bottom uh, right here, um, just think about your favorite musicians. It doesn't have to be classical. You know, who had a heart attack, who had a stroke, uh, who had diabetes. So Glenn Gould comes up, diabetes, uh, you know, uh, cancers all over the place, arthritis, Oscar Peterson, Jacqueline Dupre, MS, dementia. You can just name it and you think, wow. So, you know, the burden of chronic disease in our uh, arts population is... Uh, huge. So you've seen the kind of display of mental health and, and addiction data. Well, we've yet to sort of look at some of the chronic uh, health uh, issues. For example, in the New Orleans population, they have good data. So we have to mine that data for, you know, all the, the great jazz and, and blues musicians we've lost. We just lost Dr. John. We lost Al Toussaint. We've lost a huge number during COVID. We've lost Alice Marsalis just this year, et cetera. So it's not just not the mental health and addiction issue, but the general medicine uh, issue. So again, prevention is very important. Um, so this is, looks complicated, but it really wants you to break it down. It, it really uh, makes sense. I'm going to explode the bottom half in a, in a short while as well. So speaking of the devil, these are the three Stooges cells. So that's the bottom part of that slide. So this is actually the internal operating system of your nervous system. 
So you see at the top the blood vessel, and you see the bottom the nerve and the synapse. So synapse is the connection between nerve nerves and they communicate with neurotransmitters connecting one nerve to the next nerve. You think about one nerve to the next nerve and which it connects to this and the 30 billion or so cells and blah blah blah. You have these neural networks which all are controlled by the glial cells. Okay, it's not funny. Glial excitotoxicity from cortisol. So the guy in the middle, I call him, if you're familiar with the Three Stooges analogy, that's the Mo cell, the boss, controls uh, a lot of the basic functions, especially across the synapse and neurotransmitters and the energy consumption. The one on the right, I call him the Larry cell with the fuzzy hair, uh, is the microglia that controls the immune system. So you can see all these inflammatory <coughs> uh, cytokines that are uh, generated by the excitotoxicity from cortisol. Now the bald guy looking over here is the oligodendrocyte, which controls myelin, the waxy coating on the neuron, which transmits the electrical impulses. So this is, you can see with the excitotoxicity, the damage to the conduction of the nerve, whether it's compressed or in this case, toxic from the stress. So that's the origin of say MS, a multiple sclerosis. So you can see a wide range of, of um, medical conditions that can be generated from this basic biological model. Uh, anxiety, depression, again, serotonin, norepinephrine uh, issues in the neural networks. Again, the uh, astrocyte is the, or the Mo cell is the bad actor in, in, in that uh, pathophysiology. So that really is uh, really a hotbed of medical research now. What is the function of the glial cells? Now, of course, with COVID, you get this darn virus and then the immune system completely freaks out and you get these cytokine storms and then you're into clotting problems, of course, respiratory problems, neurological problems, as you're probably following day to day. And it's quite terrifying to see how, how can a, a virus from you know, a meat market in China you know, spread this SARS COVID-19 uh, virus. So there's lots to be explored just even in standard infectious diseases. But in our world, we're talking about what we perceive as the wrong no. What is our concept of perfection? And these guys go wild depending on how we interpret our reality. Just to put some uh, proof in the pudding, um, this is a, again complicated, but just to drive home the point of these microglial cells in the nervous system and how it affects the immune system. So uh, there is stress, it could be an injury, uh, not necessarily muscles or nerves, it could be uh, what's going on in your gut, um, uh, what's actually happening in your environment, creating a uh, biological immune response and then affecting the whole system. Now in terms of the mental health issues, uh, we have the neurotransmitters that uh, cross. Here's, for example, serotonin, dora, dopamine, and norepinephrine, which I've uh, discussed dopamine. And uh, if you get depleted, and run down, you get symptoms of anhedonia. I don't care about Brahms. I don't care about Bach or Beethoven anymore. And it just becomes empty and meaningless. That's a pretty sad state. And you're seeing <clears throat> many uh, orchestral musicians um, getting burned out in the audition phase or getting laid on in their careers, just burned out. Um, and that's uh, what we would call major depressive disorder. On the flip side, there's an excitatory response called involving glutamate. So if there's too much performance anxiety or if you're traumatized, there's different circuitry that ramps up the uh, anxiety or the fight or flight response and that can get wired or hardwired in there. Now you're seeing the connection of the pain centers. Good question. You're seeing connections to the motor uh, centers, control centers mood centers, all kinds of circuitry in the brain. So, but I'm trying to draw your attention here in the third movement to a common pathway 
that relates to us, uh, especially as training musicians, you have a lot more control um, in your formative years than say in your later years um, in terms of some of these mechanisms. So getting back down to the pain question, uh, here's a mock-up of a muscle uh, fiber and uh, your mind. And uh, why is muscle pain so darn common? So as we said, 84% lifetime prevalence, playing hurt 50-50% of the time. How's that possible? Well, it, you have to factor in the sympathetic response, the fight or flight, one wrong note, you die. So if that's wired into you, there are autonomic uh, sensors in your muscle that will create muscle tension and pain. Okay, so it's a circular loop. You cannot separate the mind and body. It is all is part of one uh, continuous connection going round and round in loops. Okay, so that could be just within oneself. I'm never perfect enough. Or if you are in a hostile work environment or in an abusive situation, of course, you're going to uh, get the symptom of pain and anxiety and at risk of depression, etc. So that's a good workup. Uh, Richard Gewurz out of San Diego has spent his whole life looking at the muscle mind connection. Is there actually living proof of this? So the Harvard group, Logia, uh, has taken pain patients with low, chronic low back pain, done the brain scans in the top uh, pictures versus controls, those without chronic back pain and seeing obvious imaging differences between those with chronic back pain versus controls. So it is for real. And more recent uh, studies by the same group at Harvard have looked at uh, chronic muscle pain, so-called fibromyalgia, and looking at the activation of the glial cells or three stooges cells. So here are the areas of the brain that are lit up. Um, so these are the, as you remember, the sensory motor areas in the homunculus and uh, motor planning areas, uh, some of the, not so much in the cognitive uh, frontal uh, lobe areas. And you can see the average adjusted differences between cases and controls in terms of activation in the different areas. The, I'll get into the uh, cingulate cortex, et cetera. So, but you can see the, the, it's real, it's structural. You just have to have the right gadget to measure uh, what the activation pattern. So we're not talking about pseudoscience here. This is hard, hardcore science. So how do you bring it down to the origins of the musician's clinic and why the rates are so high? So here's um, an interesting study by George Slavich out of UCLA. Uh, it's 10 years old. So he basically took his grad students and subjected them to targeted humiliating criticism. Now the students were paid 20 bucks. They, they were normal psychology students and they were asked to uh, go through uh, a number of stressful events like counting backwards, subtracting uh, seven from a thousand and being pressured to do it. And they were also doing a mock um, uh, speech while uh, in front of uh, fake judges and being humiliated. So what af happened after this experiment is that uh, those exposed to this traumatic stress activated the anterior cingulate cortex, which is the hub of the mind right there, and also activated the insula, which is where the body, oops, where the body maps are. Um, so that you take that back to the origins of the clinic. I had no idea that what was going on because I'm a pianist, I don't go to orchestra rehearsals. But uh, the joke is that, that uh, it was no joke and why the injury rates were so high in the Canadian musicians because of the, the adversarial uh, relationship between the conductor and the musicians themselves. So it does, uh, this is my big chance to, um, uh, credit to Boris for uh, creating the hotbed of injuries in Hamilton. But it, it was true right across the country uh, in the 
work of Oxum. I just presented to Oxum 30 years later plus, and uh, they're still talking about how to clean up the working conditions in the orchestra. As you know, there have been hotbeds of issues in uh, National Arts Center, Montreal Symphony, uh, locally here at Hamilton and Kitchener Waterloo, but you know that it's been rampant right across the world and and uh, a whole issue in, in terms of Me Too and, and trying to uh, clean up some of the uh, toxicity in the workplace. So that's a very, very important slide here. McMaster, yay, McMaster has actually tried to unpack what is trauma, what is abuse. And uh, this is the work of one of my dear colleagues, Dan Offord, O-F-F-O-R-D, and is now in policy in the American Academy of Pediatrics that psychological maltreatment is as harmful as physical assault. So um, egregious behavior such as spurning, terrorizing, isolating, exploiting, corrupting, denying responsiveness, mental, medical, educational neglect are the constituents of that abuse. Okay, and the risk to your health is the same as tobacco and asbestos. Okay, so it's not to be poo pooed in terms of public health data. It's a very serious issue. Yes, we have dealt with tobacco. We have dealt with asbestos, but we, we have a big challenge uh, collaboratively, um, especially with you guys in the audience about uh, how you treat each other, about the relationships, um, uh, not just with conductor and musicians, but each other. So we're all in this game together. So it's very important to remember that psychological maltreatment is the same as punching your buddy out. Just down the road, uh, an hour or so west is uh, Western University, University of Western Ontario. So I asked the question, you know, show me the data that this is actually real structural. So of course they have to use a really fancy brain scanner. So they expose kids to uh, verbal aggression from parents versus healthy controls and also bullying and humiliation. Uh, and then these are the differential brain scans uh, between cases uh, exposed and those controlled. And you can see our lovely arcuate fasciculus, the auditory motor tract, with differences between those exposed to abuse. In the cingulate, the, the transmission of the mind, the fornix, which controls um, the hormones. Uh, the insula, where the body maps are, you can see differences, as well as the superior temporal gyrus, which is where Beethoven lives. So it's where you hear, you might hear music, you might hear voices, etc. So we do have acute presenting, literally schizophrenia cases with chronic stress, uh, of course, with pain and etc. So there is structural, structural damage to the nervous system from this adverse experience. Getting down to the cellular genetic level, uh, this is going back to Blackburn and Apple's uh, seminal work for the Nobel Prize. So I've called it uh, the four Teletubbies. Seeing red, ruminating, going over and over, one wrong note. Threat to ego, bugger that beat me in that competition or beat me on the audition. A negative mind wandering, I'll never make it, it's hopeless. I'll never master this. This creates a shortening of the telomeres. So telomeres are the protective caps on, on your genetic material. So as you stress and stress, it gets shorter and shorter and eventually the cell ages prematurely and also dies. And that's the actual pathogenesis or the biological basis of all these injuries and illnesses. So it's well understood now. Don't forget this is 20, 2012. So it's roughly you know 10 years ago this research was done. So in medicine, that's really new stuff. In our real world, it's old stuff. And then at, uh, Miguel Mo Moshi uh, Ziff uh, has done work on the epigenetics. So it's not just the actual cells, but how the cells express themselves. So if you're feeling safe and secure, like this happy monkey, your genetic maps will look much greener and happier than this poor little fellow that's left alone and not mothered and loved and has a chaotic attachment. 
So you can see a lot more epigenetic effects of stress. So this is very important work. We have not yet to do this kind of research amongst performing artists, but I'm sort of getting you all interested in about attachments and how you feel about yourself and your, your art and your work. So how do you protect yourself? Well, whether it's your internal voices, I just turn on your noise canceling headphones. I just can't hear myself get mad at myself, you know, buggering up that piece or that bad audition or being criticized for my diminuendo or retardando, etc. And just remember these, these targeted humiliating criticisms carry uh, uh, a weight of 22 times uh, of adverse cortisol effects. So it's somehow you gotta tune that stuff out. Same applies if you're in a toxic work environment, if you're targeted by the conductor and nailed and humiliated. Well, that's something collectively we have to clean up. So uh, that's perfect end for movement three. I'll take a quick break there. So maybe Alexandra can collate some questions and then we'll go to a dashing finish with treatment. So I'll take a two minute break. Alors on va prendre une pause de deux minutes tout le monde. So we don't have any questions at the moment. Um, <laughs> Si vous avez des questions, maintenant le moment de les poser. If you guys have any questions, now would be the moment to ask them. And if not, then I guess we could move on to the next section. Great. We'll dash on. The third movement, as you know, is pretty heavy going. So all that science. But just to give you an idea, this is not just, uh, you know, we're really working hard around the world in this area. Of course, COVID's like kind of swamped everything in terms of research. But it does apply because if you see these cytokine storms, it's really quite amazing, you know, and uh, pretty scary stuff. Okay, so we'll cycle back to the original theme. So the risk factors for overuse injury are change of teacher or instrument, intense preparation for performance, preparing new and difficult repertoire, excluding Canadian composer repertoire, and long periods of performance without rest. So that was well published in the 80s and Christine Zaza has written it up and this, this, uh, these concepts are well confirmed by Bronwyn's study in, in Sydney. So that just really puts it all in a nutshell for you. So how do we prevent it? So that was the, the last question after uh, the second movement. Well, rest breaks. So that's why every 20, 25 minutes I take a break, whether I, do a stretch or meditation. Um, so there's lots of resources uh, in terms of stretching. It again, depends where you've got a problem, what type of instruments, uh, where you hold your attention, etc. Exercise cannot be underestimated. I mean, to get, be in the best possible shape aerobically as well as anaerobically is very important. So the demands of playing musical instruments in a symphony orchestra or a marching band or playing, God forbid, Brahms Opus 8. It's amazingly intense work, okay? And then when you go and, and rehearse for two, three hours and practice for another six hours, you can imagine the demands uh, cardiovascularly and that, that has an amount of oxygen you're consuming. So that's uh, very important. So you gotta work on that. That's part of your practicing, put, building up your resilience ergonomics so again optimize your setup or optimize your technique that's why you have these uh, incredible faculty there's lots on, on youtube right now if you want to study piano biomechanics and look at uh, garrick olson or look at old footage of arthur rubenstein and look at their posture etc so again we can go back and reference you know what things actually work. So I've done some of that <clears throat> research stuff in the clinic and through PAMA of what actually does make a difference. So I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But the key point here is don't play through the pain. That's a, that's a signal coming from your body saying stop, you know, pay attention. It doesn't mean quit, 
forever. It just means pay attention to why your thumb's hurting when playing the clarinet, why your neck's hurting when you're playing violin for the last you know ten hours. And so it's it's in a it's part of your mindfulness being. It's not to be feared. It's it's to be uh, made aware of and then uh, start to break it down with some of the new concepts that you've learned today. So what I've done in the clinic is develop what I call the APE lab, the Art of Psychophysiology and Ergonomics lab, <clears throat> to, to work with patients as well as uh, other research uh, subjects to try to understand how do we create resilience. So this is built on what's called mirror neurons, monkey see, monkey do. So if you see it, you might be able to do it. But the point is you're the monkey, so how do you see yourself? Good question. So that's where the whole area of biofeedback uh, becomes very powerful to see what your muscle cells are doing, seeing what your heart rate variability is doing. Um, again, I can't put a uh, thinking cap on you and uh, see what you're thinking because we don't have a brain scanner in the clinic, but we do have questionnaires about your anxiety response and et cetera, et cetera. So again, once you see yourself, you can actually do something about that and what, uh, have the will to make a change and have an action plan. So the, the ABCs of creating resilience is first of all, paying attention to alignment or so-called posture. So you all have heard about the Alexander technique. You wonder how Glenn Gould got away with playing crunched over or Bill Evans crunched over. And of course, coordination. So breathing is, we don't, I don't recall one lesson in the thousands of music lessons that I've had and expert coaching and training about breathing. Now it's sort of like, you know, in sports, you should better breathe before you hit the ball and into the lake. In coordination, it's completely fascinating about uh, what are the optimal techniques. Uh, in playing your musical instrument. So now you're seeing lots of publications starting to come out of, about that, uh, as well as looking at anxiety, performance anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Diet is critical, right? So you can think about the musician's diet, uh, chicken wings and beer, and a hamburger and a milkshake. That's what I grew up on. Um, going plant-based, cutting your alcohol to close to zero, et cetera. Tough to do, but that's where we have to uh, go towards. Exercise. So how do you actually get a metric? So here's all my fitness watches here. You know, as, am I getting enough steps? Uh, how is my heart rate variability when I'm golfing or practicing uh, the Vorjak Quintet, etc.? How is my ability to focus? Of course, now we're stuck on Zoom six, eight hours a day. You know, we're just literally, you know, drained, uh, surprisingly how draining it is. What is the goal? So what are we setting micro goals in our practice session, daily goals, weekly goals, overall goals is critical. And targeting not just musical perfection goals, thinking goals, positive thoughts, um, forgiveness, uh, uh, anticipatory anxiety, what could happen? How do I practice uh, getting a bad critique in my master class, etc. How to, and so we're working on some of these uh, uh, strategies to, again, the target here is to, to be tougher on the job because you can see this is pretty uh, tough uh, way to make a living, but a beautiful way to spend your life. So some of the gadgetries in the Ape Lab, <clears throat> we have Surface EMG, which I'll uh, show you a couple samples. We have Motion Capture, which you uh, can see on uh, a Discovery Channel clip uh, that I have. Uh, obviously, audio video feedback. You can do that yourself with your cell phone or a Zoom camera. Uh, heart rate variability uh, was, in the older days, very cumbersome now. You can get it literally on my Garmin watch and see how my stress response changes depending whether I'm meditating in the backyard or you know, driving myself nuts you know, trying to learn a Dr. John riff. Neurobiofeedback, uh, again, brainwave uh, analysis is uh, now uh, 
uh, quite available and uh, you can use it on your iPad and or iPhone. Uh, I've just done a comprehensive review all of, of all the different psychotherapy techniques which could be useful to musicians such as mindfulness-based stress reduction, cognitive behavioral therapy, and positive psychology therapy. <clears throat> Uh, much interest in uh, brain stimulation, whether it be magnetic or direct current. Uh, we have that in the clinic. Uh, acupuncture techniques going back 5,000 years are very uh, effective if you get the right points to, to uh, uh, alter the, the pain circuitry and of course medications, which I'll get into. So a lot of that is rapidly changing how we you know, treat uh, mental health and pain conditions. So I've just constructed a program um, called the 12 tone tune up targets for performance exposure therapy, based it on the tone row in no specific order, but it begins with awareness, <clears throat> looks at anxiety, um, about healthy boundaries, uh, cognition, motor control, depression, dependence, exercise, fatigue, focus, goals, and graduation. So uh, just put that together. Um, it should be quite fun. Can't uh, wait to really get it going. So it probably won't be until COVID really settles down. I've done some, some of the uh, trial work getting it going. Here's a sample of the great Garrick Olson. So I've got the surface EMG uh, electrodes stuck on his shoulders or trapezius muscles as well as his forearm extensors. So you saw, based on movement two, the rationale for picking those injury spots. So I asked Garrick, just go to your favorite place and relax. So this is, this is his muscle signals in his left and right upper trapezius, shoulder muscles, and his left and right forearm. Basically nothing, okay? So when he meditates, and he does every day, he does yoga every day, he's able to calm his body down to baseline to virtually nothing, no signal at all. Brilliant. Then I asked him to do the famous clip from the pianist, the G minor ballad, and do the octave passage, which is a total bugbear. Now he's, you know, well endowed in terms of big hands like Rachmaninoff. He's six foot four, so he pianos, you know, midget, but then he's recorded, as you know, all the Chopin and got into Scriabin. So this is what his muscle signals look like, left and right shoulder, left and right forearm. And this is in pounding out the uh, octave stuff. So we can quantify the power output of the muscles when doing a specific task. So we can go into micro and analyze uh, what he can do. So we did a couple of repetitions of this uh, famous passage. He doesn't buy into the one wrong note you die. He plays it and he, he, you know, he's just a joy to work with. And he said, one of his famous quotes to me was, less is more. The less he tries, the more he gains. So the more uh, to in, improve his output, he, he just takes it easy. He plays it, you know, pretty easy. He doesn't push himself. He's not trying to prove anything to anybody, including himself. So it's amazing, that's published in um, Clavier Companion uh, with my colleague, um, Kathleen Riley. And it was great fun to work with a uh, great artist like Garrick. And of course in Canada, we're doing some work on cannabis and specifically CBD, uh, uh, cannabidiol, which is the anti-inflammatory, the medical uh, component of the cannabis plant. Also, THC, indica, and sativa have their uses, um, but we're not smoking the whole bag of joints here. Um, and this goes back, again, 5,000 years of Asian medicine. So, but we're actually unpacking the uh, 250 cases right now to see what the effect in the last year of uh, CBD and, and other tinctures. So this is orally taken, it's not smoked. It's mixed in oil, it's produced by the licensed producers in a very controlled uh, production and controlled dosing. So that's the kind of research we're doing in the clinic right now as we speak. So the last uh, slide is the, the summary slide. The prevention of overuse is the control of use. So it's just not controlling 
the biomechanics, of course, that's important, but all of what you think, what you feel, your environment, it's all encompassing you as an artist. So uh, that is the, the root in about prevention of these injuries and illnesses. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, there's a lot of content to cover. So uh, we'll let Alexandra launch into some of the questions. We have uh, 11 minutes before your uh, masterclass. Thanks very much. Alexandra, there you are. Alors, si vous avez des questions, maintenant est le moment de les poser pendant qu'on est tous ici avec notre invité. If you guys have questions, now would be the time while we're still here with our guest. We don't have any at the moment, but I'll wait to see some come in. Do you have any last um, tips for them, I guess? If they don't have any questions, do you have any frequent <laughs> questions that you'd like to address well, i'll put a question to you guys um you know again this is unfortunate i can't discuss it with you but how is it going during covid you know so it's so strange you know trying to do musical kind of work together on these zoom platforms we're all struggling with the technical stuff but how does it work you know how does it feel are any of these things helpful to you you know i mean how do you work with a faculty member working on uh, you know, your phrasing or, you know, I'm having a problem here, I, you know, how, how do I work on alignment in violin, with, you know, or treatment of thoracic outlets and very basic stuff, but I can't, if you're not here, I can't put the surface EMG on the trapezius muscles and your neck muscles, all right? I can't put the halo on you, which is a pretty neat gadget here. I guess it almost reaches. Yeah, there it is. So there's your brain wave. It just goes on your brain like this. Pretty neat. Um, heart rate variability. I can't put the pulse meter on you. So I'm kind of like helpless uh, in this kind of virtual situation. <clears throat> I'm curious as, uh, you know, high level performers, uh, how you work with your high level faculty and pedagogues, you know, are you actually getting the right stuff? Um, it's, uh, it's better than nothing, obviously, but, you know, that's the question I would, is it easier or is it uh, more effective? Is it more stressful? You know, those questions. Of course, I can't get an answer, but I'll leave you with some of these. And how, how intense do you need? What quick and dirty meditation relaxation techniques or breathing techniques can you use? No. An answer from um, on you who says um, personally he likes to stay at home, so he's, <laughs> he's fine. But giving so much time to practice at home has actually helped him improve, and his viola playing has improved a lot since the started since March. Great, yeah, I'll share that. I've been uh, woodshedding a lot in my two piano stuff and duets. Yeah, so it's great. You know, when you don't have to rush off to do you know twenty nine different other things in the daytime so so again each to his own you know but um it's it's a tough time because it, we live in such a social world especially in education or in in professional arts it's very social very interactive it's all about relationships so you can see i've obviously this talk is on the negative side what to avoid but uh, or protect yourself from but on the positive side you know I dearly miss my chamber music friends and you know I miss the buzz of the audience you know mm -hmm. so as a musician so it's uh it's, it's and I'm not sure what the new normal is going to be what I call the paranormal so where are we going to land in a year or two once the vaccine's out and this uh, damn pandemic is gone but also worrying about the next pandemic so, so you can see the monkey mind rolling along so, you know, make sure you get your sleep. That's the most important thing. You know, it's not just eight hours, but it's the quality of your deep sleep and uh, how you defrag your brain, clean out your mind so that you're, you got a fresh uh, day ahead and fresh working and, and lots of fun. Very important to stress the positive psychology, the positive attitude. Nothing is ever 
completely black or completely perfect. You know, somewhere in the middle is all good. You know, so so try to in moderation. This is important. We have a question from Mathieu who says, you say you can't separate the mind from the body. When you get injured, how much of it is physical and how much of it could simply be in your head? Well, it's all circuitry. So you're correct, it's in your head because it's in your brain and it's in your neck and it's in your spinal cord and it's in all those nerves and all the chemicals. So that's why you have to look at it as an integrated system. And the challenge medically is what is going on and where do we intervene? And so it's not an easy answer, uh, not specific that you can just bandage your thumb in the clarinet thumb that's, you know, or change your thumb support. That's, that's the most simplest case. Or just change your shoulder rest in your viola. Um, you got to look at all the different. So when you come for intake, it's a pain because I'll, I'll give you, you know, a couple, two, three hours where it's a questionnaire to fill out about anxiety or your past history, trauma history, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to look at all the different rocks, look under them, and then we'll go from there, right? And, and have a treatment plan or an action plan to target uh, specific aspects, as I said, in the 12-tone targets. So it's all of the above. Good question. Well, anything else like that's it okay um, if anyone else has any questions or if not thank you so much for giving us your time and for that really interesting um lecture and everything thanks so much for being here with us merci à tout le monde d'avoir participé aujourd'hui great appreciate it thanks very much for your attention and uh if you need anything you can just email me through uh Alexandra or Pace or uh, Maurizio, and I'll be happy to respond to anything that comes up in the future. So all the best to you. Enjoy your working together. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. See ya.